welcome to a new episode of GDA Conversations brought to you by the Gulf Downstream Association. Water sustains life. Water also sustains our industry. You all know how much we depend on water in our industry. We need water for steam, we need it for cooling, we need it for cleaning, we need it for firefighting and a number of other tasks. And perhaps that's the reason most of our plants are based near some water body. However, this water resource is not plentiful, it's a scarce. And that scarcity is increasing day by day. So the topic of today's conversation is total water management. And to talk about this subject, we have an authority in this field, Dr. Joff Townswin. Dr. Joff works with Ecolab. He is a PhD in environment chemistry from the University of Cambridge. He is leading the innovation team of the Ecolab's water and energy and he gives his strategic directions to Ecolab's clients. He's also part of ISO 14046 Standard Committee for Water Footprinting. He's also associated with the leader of Water Europe's Water Smart Industry Group. Also, he's associated with Alliance for Water Stewardship, AWS, and World Wildlife Fund. And his entire career's focus is on circular economy to combat population growth and climate change events. Now, before I hand over to Dr. Joff, I would like to play a small clip to highlight the importance of water management Without water, life on Earth could not exist. Access to adequate supplies of clean, fresh water is critical to the health and well-being of people around the world. But over the past century, urbanization, population growth, changing diets, and energy production demand have put increasing stress on the world's water supply. By 2030, the demand for fresh water is expected to exceed supply by 40%. The underlying conditions behind this are not apt to change. So it's up to us to adapt and change with them by addressing water scarcity head on. At Ecolab, we are guided by our vision to provide and protect what is vital. Clean water, safe food, abundant energy, and healthy environments. Our customized approach helps you transform your business by transforming how you manage your water. Shifting from linear to circular water management by reducing, reusing, and recycling across operations for optimal water efficiency allows you to grow your business to meet the world's growing demands while ensuring water will be there for future generations. No one is better positioned to help you minimize water use and maximize performance at an optimized cost. Learn how we can partner with you to address this critical global challenge. Okay, so welcome, uh, Dr. Joff. 
Uh, how are you feeling? Are you okay, safe and healthy? Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. And uh, hello, everyone. And uh, it's a great privilege to be with you today. Uh, just as I share my screen, I want to thank you, Raj, for the introduction. And also thank you uh, to the other organizers of the uh, Gulf Downstream Association for this opportunity to have a conversation on uh, total water management. Thank you. Well, thank you again. And um, after very briefly introducing Nalco Water, which is a, an Ecolab company, I would like to spend a few moments setting the scene on the key water challenges uh, that have been faced by the GCC. And then prior to focusing on the total water management framework that's able to address these to a great extent, I'd also like to take a few moments to highlight the importance of valuing uh, water correctly. So just a little bit about uh, uh, Ecolab. Ecolabs uh, is the global leader, as you can see here, in water hygiene and uh, energy technologies and services uh, that protect people and vital resources. It's a large company. We have 50,000 associates around the world, 27,000 of which are sales and service professionals, uh, customer facing day in, day out. We're present at nearly 3 million uh, customer locations across uh, almost 170 uh, countries. And we, we place a very uh, strong emphasis on innovation. We have over 10,000 patents, some of which are in this space that we're talking about today of, of uh, total water management. And in, in 2019, which is our last complete data set, um, we touched about 1.1 trillion gallons of water globally. And with our partnerships, we helped empower our customers to save 206 billion gallons, which is 780 million meter cubed. So that's equivalent to the drinking water needs for 712 million people. And of course, water and energy are linked in, in a variety of ways. And, and in that process and other uh, energy saving initiatives as well across Ecolab, we save 1.5 million tons of CO2. Um, we reduce the water and energy footprint of approximately 40% of the world's petroleum production, 20% of the world's power, and our ambition is to save 300 billion gallons uh, by 2030, which is equivalent to the drinking water needs of a billion people, and also to save 4.5 million tonnes uh, of CO2. In setting the scene, this certainly this first part of the slide, you will resonate very well with you. You know, the, the GCC countries have seen remarkable economic development, um, renowned for that globally, and accompanying that quite considerable population growth. And of course, the combination of both of those play, can place great pressure on resource consumption and emissions. Um, and it actually could lead to quite significant economic, environmental and social detriment if not addressed over the longer term. So there is this, overriding need to, to move from what we historically call a, a linear economic model, which is described here in, in the picture, where you have raw materials go to production, you use it, and then you waste. As you know, we're thinking very seriously about moving to a circular economy. Um, various efforts are going around the globe in relation to this, but let's not fool ourselves. This is an easy endeavor. It requires a very robust framework. You have to consider a lot of factors, and it has to be certainly very holistic. So it has to consider alternative sources of energy, ability to expand recycling, development of new materials, better ability to close off loops and drive circularity. So this is a long-term project, but what we do know is that water is right at the key of such an important initiative as this. So you're probably familiar with the water energy food nexus and all the interrelationships between those, but we increasingly see the, the, the energy, food and waste recovery nexus, the few two nexus it's starting to be called. I don't often start presentations with a really busy table of data, but this table describes really the essence of the problems that are being faced uh, in relation to water and the GCC countries. The left hand column, you'll see the mean annual rainfall. And you'll notice that a lot of the, most for most countries is actually less than uh, 100 millimeters per annum. So renewable water resources for the GCC are among the lowest in the world. And then the columns highlighted in blue right in the center really spell out a very compelling situation. And that is because small amounts of rainfall, very high 
evaporation rates, of course, the ability to actually recharge the groundwater from which you depend so significantly, around 75 to 80 percent of all your water is coming from groundwater. So the ability to recharge that is very limited. And of course, you abstract vast quantities of groundwater. So there is this enormous deficit growing uh, between the ability to recharge and the amount of abstraction. And as you can see from the uh, the, the fourth column here on, on the groundwater abstraction rates and, and uh, hectometers a million meter cubed, they're really outstripping um, the ability to recharge in a very significant way for most countries. Now, as we see groundwater depletion, obviously we have to use more energy to extract that water because of course it's deeper. And we also typically see deteriorating water quality as well. So, so not only is there a fundamental imbalance between recharge and abstraction, there are also a lot of knock on consequences in relation to energy and CO2 emissions and also water quality, which obviously often consumes energy to purify further, etc. So suddenly we can get ourselves into a bit of a downward spiral that really needs addressing. Now, your net needs at the moment, particularly for municipal supply, are met through desalination. And again, the GCC countries is the world hub for, for desalination. Uh, you have phenomenal expertise and abilities and networks um, regarding that te those technologies. And you can see on, on this slide the amounts of, of desalinated water being produced. But again, if you compare it with the total consumption, including agriculture, municipality and industry, it's still a relatively small proportion. And I think a lot of effort has been put into recent years about using treated wastewater. As you can see here, some countries use the vast majority of their treated wastewater, not for municipal use, but for other purposes, whereas others have quite a long way to go. So we know that in the GCC countries, renewable water resources are among the lowest in the world. The annual per capita water use is three times the world average. So typically in the GCC, it's 560 litres per day, as opposed to the average around the world of 180 litres per day. There's actually been a fourfold increase in water consumption in your region over the last uh, 20 years. And the rising population, and, and, and a really accelerating agricultural demand is responsible for that. But water demand is expected to further increase and the conservative estimates are 50% by the year 2050. And of course, it depends on the region and how it weans itself gradually off groundwater will dictate how much extra water is needed. So again, conservative estimates suggest that 77% extra water is needed by, by 2050. So it's very significant. Now, of course, if you're well-developed economies, you can offset the impact of water scarcity to a great extent through high energy reserves and economic power. And in fact, energy production for water desalination and these groundwater withdrawals is, are the single biggest, is the single biggest user uh, of energy uh, in the area. So as a result of high energy production and consumption in the GCC countries, it makes you one of the highest per capita users or emitters of uh, CO2 emissions. So that is obviously a concern. But as we try to understand ways to address groundwater depletion, it's then we face up to the complexity of water as a resource. And in, I would argue that water is the most complex of all resources. And re for the reason being it's local, so you're very much dependent on local supplies and that's as applicable to surface water is to groundwater. It's a finite supply. And in fact, many of the supplies in, in Saudi, Saudi Arabia, for example, are deemed fossil water. So they're truly non-renewable. But of course, it's a shared resource. We all have access to it, municipalities, agriculture, industry. So how do we actually manage such a complex resource um, in a way that's fair and reasonable and certainly sustainable? At the same time, we know that water is a really crucial input to the petrochemical industry and Raj um, highlighted that in his introduction. Um, a lot of water that's actually consumed by industry is linked to cooling processes and thereby lost by evaporation. But as you see, we can put typical amounts uh, or ratios, consumption ratios between water used per litre of gasoline or fuel oil, diesel, etc. And we keep quite a uh, an eye on these efficiency figures and see how we can drive them down over time. 
but there are broader challenges in the GCC countries, and these resonate globally as well. Not only do we see water shortages and some of the challenges around that and the interrelationship with energy and CO2 emissions, but of course we want to maintain reliable operations. And in fact, reliability is king. And if you have high rates of reliability, you invariably have um, high um, levels of operational efficiency and availability of plant. Those two things, these things are very much interrelated. Um, you also want to expand operations, grow, uh, requiring, requiring more water, of course. There's likely to be changes on the regulatory landscape over the coming years, which need to be taken into consideration. A lot of drivers, of course, to optimize plant efficiency and, and, and associated costs. Then there's this people dimension, of course, safety being absolutely paramount. But what we're seeing across the industry is uh, a loss of talent, a loss of experienced people that retire and may not be replaced uh, by others working in utilities and having this very fundamental understanding of water and the complexity of water and how to manage water. And this then brings me on to this topic of managing water, which is really a subset of how we value water. And if we're going to be effective at total water management, we really need to understand how to value water. It's very critical, it's fundamental. And in a way, valuing water is the process of monetizing risk because there are so many risks attached to water, which I'll, I'll explain um, a little bit in, in a moment. And if we can get the correct price per meter cubed of water, that then drives the right behaviors and the right decisions and the right investment strategies with regard to recovering water and developing a really comprehensive total water management strategy. So there's this old adage, you've probably heard it many times, you can't manage what you don't measure. So it's very important that we measure key elements. So that means quantities, flows, flow meters and such like. That's not always very easy in the context of a petrochemical plant. Where to measure, you know, distance from elbows and all these things come into play regarding flow meters. Quality, really important, but again, there may not be sample points in the ideal places to have an understanding of how water quality changes through an operation. Increasingly, we're focused on the enthalpy, the energy that water contains, because hot water contains a lot of energy associated with some significant uh, value as a consequence, and obviously emission dimensions as well. So, valuing water is not straightforward, as I've highlighted, but what we do know is that the value of water invariably exceeds its price. And when we look at the value of water, it is the value of, but also the value in, and the nutrients it contains, the metal sometimes, as, as I've already highlighted, the energy. So where do we draw the boundaries around the value of water? Do we include the cost to produce it, the cost to abstract it from, from, from the ground, the cost to move it across uh, a production site, the pumping cost, the cost to heat, the cost to treat, the cost to dispose? Do we just take an emission-centric view of water and say, look, these are the emissions associated with my water, therefore if I save water, I save emissions? Do we consider the cost to clean, um, risk-adjusted prices, et cetera? There are so many different aspects to valuing water. But why it's so important is that without that exercise being done correctly, there'll be minimal confidence to invest in water-saving technologies. And in fact, the big value elements are associated with the major risk factors associated with water. And we divide those into the top the, into three areas, and I'll come on to uh, the operational risk in a moment. So first is a physical risk. This is about access to water, recognizing your operations really dependent on water. So if you have a disruption of supply or a lack of availability or a sudden reduction in, in quality, that has a material risk to your operation. But we're also likely to see change in regulation um, coming over the, over the next few years, which could also put a lot of pressure on operations to change. So the regulatory risk can be very significant. In some parts of the world, this is a massive cost impact on their operation. And then there's this more subtle, but nonetheless very important area of reputational risk. If you're seen as a, a water user or a profligate water user in a water scarce area, that often has very adverse effects in terms of the wider stakeholders and investment strategies, the way you're viewed, viewed by the general public. So the reput reputational risk element is certainly significant, but then there's this overall operational risk. And I wanted to stop here for a few moments because this is really important. We can look at volumes of water, meter cube per hour, and we can look at its quality and, and we can 
put numbers against those and we can estimate risks. But if we shift the risk from things that are really visible, like quantity and quality, to things that are hidden, like poor water management. So for example, corrosion rates because of poor, poorly managed uh, water that's got higher chloride or higher sulfate in, or higher microbiological growth potentials that produce biofilm, um, or higher scaling potentials that really interfere between you know, they will interfere with the process of transferring energy across a heat exchanger. Those tend to be those hidden impacts that can be very, very costly to operation. And when we start talking about total water management, we can, yes, change the water quality. We can manage poorer water quality as a consequence. But we have to be very careful that we don't shift the risk to things that will impact asset preservation and energy efficiency but as i say tend to be hidden away in the dark recesses of a uh, of, of an operation a refinery for example that may be long-term processes that only come to light all of a sudden and, and kind of catch you out unawares so what we really need to understand when we start total water management strategies is this overall operational risk every dimension of the risk and then convert that risk into into a financial value, monetizing risk, and then let that monetized risk inform the decisions that actually enable growth and sustainable growth. So there's some really key, key interrelationships at the heart of total water management. There's your growth strategy. You, know, you may want it to grow 8, 10% per annum or, or, or over the next few years. That means more water consumption invariably. You have your own key business drivers on your product mix and your sustainability initiatives and the role of in innovation and adoption of new technology. And then you have this corporate risk element of which water is very significant piece for the GCC countries, this area I've just highlighted. And then you've got this other dimension to, to total water management is, do I what are my flows? Do I have enough in terms of quantity? What are the maximum flows? How do I accommodate those maximum flows, maybe associated with maximum demand or maximum production? Then the quality elements, the limiting factors, maybe it's chloride or sulfate or calcium because of the involvement in producing scale, which can have such a big impact on energy efficiency and such like. So what is the limiting factor around the quality of water I manage, how that impact my operation? And of course, as we look at quantity and quality, it's very much with the end use in mind, this purpose. And of course, that's where we introduce the operational risk knowing that some systems are much more vulnerable to poorer quality water than others. So that has to be factored in. So as you can see, water availability is a function of quantity, quality and purpose. So we have to have this very holistic view to total water management. And in fact, we can, the purpose really is to balance two enormous costs. One is on the left-hand side, the cost of impact. So doing nothing invariably results in big impact costs whether that's exposure to water scarcity or poor management of water, you know, and corrosion, et cetera. And on the right hand side, there's this cost of mitigation. And of course, the greater the risk, the more attention it needs to be given to the mitigating strategies and they can be costly and they need to be considered in the longer term. So how do we produce a roadmap for total water management that gets these two big cost centers pretty much in balance? Well, the only way that can be achieved so that it doesn't impact your bottom line unnecessarily is to have a lot of data, a lot of information to guide this roadmap, to guide this strategy, to help us navigate through this so that you're not um, exposed to excess financial risk as a consequence. So for that, we need lots of data, lots of insights to ensure that we can do this properly. And we need to have a really solid understanding of value in terms of best available techniques and strategies and the way that we need to obviously reduce demand for natural resources and understand the impacts on system operations and how to reduce those so that we can be much more energy efficient we can reduce water and reduce emissions to air in a very holistic cohesive way and in ecolab we describe we describe this as exponential value it's not just the operational efficiency but it's the sustainable impact improvements and the imp improved performance to the operation that collectively these big multipliers that, pr that provide exponential value from which we can calculate a return on investment uh, for your operation. So right at the heart of total water management are the three R's, reduce, reuse and recycle. 
But at the front end, as you can see in the left hand column here, we need a lot of capabilities, a lot of knowledge and understanding. We need understanding about the chemistry, how to manage these operations, the technologies that are available to save water. And increasingly, the, the amazing impact that digital uh, processes, platforms and such like can have in this area. You know, water scarcity is a systems problem and it needs system solutions. And what better than the, the new digital world to address those? If we do it properly, reduce, reuse, recycle, and we balance all of these financial investment strategies, operational considerations that I've highlighted, then we're able to generate a very powerful value proposition, not just on minimizing water, which is obviously a key objective here, but on truly maximizing results and optimizing the total cost of, of operation, the TCO. So all of those things need to be considered collectively um, in the investment plan. So how do we build a total water management roadmap? Well, we, first of all, we start with reduce because those that relates to the equipment, the systems, the units that we already have. And it's really about efficiency of, a, of those operations, our existing operation. How can we um, in, increase cycles of concentration in a cooling system, for example? But we also have to recognize, and this is tried to, you know, we try to describe this here with the increasing size of shape as you move from left to right, is that we often can only achieve a say a four, five, I don't know, eight, sometimes a 10% reduction in water use via reduction processes only with, with single applications. They tend to be less than 10%, many in the four or five percent. With reuse, we're actually taking water and without treating it significantly, repurposing it between applications, we often save in the region of 20% water, maybe a little bit more, 20, 25%. But if we want to go beyond that and achieve really significant water savings of 30, 40, 50 or even 70 or even beyond percent, we're very much in recycled territory. And that does mean post treatment applications typically involving membranes. So we're guided in terms of our ambition by the three R's and all of them are applicable. And I want to just go through these uh, briefly. So as you can immediately recognize, this is not a. Uh, a refinery or a petrochemical plant is actually a cheese making factory, but the principles are the same. We have to look at opportunities around pre-treatment to reduce cooling systems, boilers, processes, post-treatment. All of these are great opportunities for us to reduce the amount of water that we're using. But to get, to get those insights and to make sure we don't compromise the operational impacts, we do need a lot of information. So we're dependent on automation and metering and monitoring. But once that's in place and we really have a clear understanding of what room we have to further optimize, then often we can proceed on that basis. And as I say, cooling towers, big water users, boilers as well, they're normally fertile ground for making significant reduction opportunities. Invariably, when we save uh, water in this way, we're also saving energy, boilers being a, a most obvious, obvious example here. So then now reuse. So reuse, as already highlighted, is taking water from one application to another and developing a little bit of circularity now within the operation. We could have direct use of wastewater. This is not putting it through any membranes, it's intervening at a stage in wastewater collection where the quality of that water is still very, very acceptable. So with no treatment requirement at all, we can repurpose that water. Sometimes, for example, in the final rinse or of a backwash, we have very, very good water quality that we can immediately repurpose somewhere else and, and, and capture that saving. Condensate recovery is often an interesting area as well, but not least because of its high energy content and its value. So we can start to understand now the circularity opportunities and introduce that. But then that really comes into its fore with recycle, where we're taking wastewater, we're putting it through, as I said, membrane type processes, often with filtration up front, and then we're producing a very high quality water, very similar to the desalinating, desalination water quality coming into to the operation and saying, you know, how do we then repurpose it? What, what are the big users? What, what, what matches the flow I'm actually producing from my recycle strategy? And of course, if you're under a lot of regulatory pressure to go to either minimum liquid discharge or even zero liquid discharge, which is the case in many parts of the world, then what we then obviously a very um, well thought through recycle strategy is critical because you're actually going to end up with solid material, for example, with zero liquid discharge, i.e. actually a crystallizer and solid material being produced. So, so we need to make sure that those final steps where 
the costs really escalate are really thought through uh, very, very carefully and, and making sure that there's a good balance between CapEx and OpEx expenditure. The next couple of slides, I just want to focus on some really big opportunities for reuse um, uh, in the GCC countries. And this is already happening at quite some scale, but perhaps not so much in industry. And that is really the, the, the reuse of tertiary uh, treated effluent or treated sewage effluent, as it's called in the region. And as you can see here, there's a lot available, right? So this is a meter cube per day. So this is a remarkable resource, but it has its challenges. And those challenges start with very high variability. You know, wastewater, municipal wastewater changes, you know, not just hour by hour, but almost moment by moment. So we really need to understand that variability and the potential impacts of highs and lows, et cetera and those cost impacts that we, we, we can have that are associated with that. Not surprisingly, treated effluent has a really high microbiological growth potential. It contains very high quantities of bacteria. A lot of those are pathogenic. So certainly that needs to be managed very effectively, but it can be managed. We have technologies such like pureate chlorine dioxide that are very, very effective at, um, at controlling the growth of microorganisms in this context. If you don't control those things properly, there obviously is a safety issue over health, but also biofilm forms, which impacts energy and uh, emissions and such like, and the assets, corrosion. So we have to gain have this total cost impact perspective with the operation very much in mind and what the purpose is. Um, uh, sewage effluent can have high scaling potentials because of the calcium it contains, often has high, highest concentrations of uh, orthophosphate as well combination of calcium and orthophosphate produces a risk of calcium phosphate scale. So that needs managing as well. And then it can be quite aggressive. It has chloride, sulfate, other things in there as well, ammonia that can impact copper corrosion, et cetera. So it has quite a high cor corrosion potential. The point I'm making here is all of that can be managed very, very well. And, you know, a lot of uh, thought and process work has gone into developing super robust programs that build a lot of resilience in the reuse of water but at the heart of those programs is a lot of monitoring um, and, and and all the control systems associated with that this needs real close attention with regard to its management but very doable and we can provide case histories this is just a small um, case history for a, a district cooling system uh, I think it was in, in uh, near Abu Dhabi but the significance savings can be very significant when we talk about recycle, remember this is taking wastewater, for example, and putting it through membranes so we get very, very good quality. We need to be also aware of the impact that that wastewater has on the membranes themselves. And it's so important this is managed because if it's not managed properly, you can end up with much, much higher, 50 percent higher total cost of operation. Now, we're seeing enormous growth in the use of membranes in wastewater. Of course, you're most familiar with that in re relation to desalination, of course, widely used taking seawater, uh, desalinating through membranes in, in GCC. But we're seeing a growth now in wastewater. And because of the organic content, because of the, the bug content as well, the bacterial content, there's a tr there's tremendous uh, uh, potential to form biofilm actually on the membrane surface itself. Of course, nice warm temperatures in your region help that process uh, swimmingly. So, so we do need to pay a lot of pay a lot of attention to how we manage biofilm growth on membranes. It really is very critical, and typically biofilm is responsible for seventy to eighty percent of all foulants on membranes. But there are others as well. There are, you know, small particles, solid materials that can get through. So we need to have really good pretreatment strategies, you know, like um, ultrafiltration, for example. Um, or even media filtration or clarification up front. And, the, and when you start to look at these pretreatment strategies, there's a real balance between CAPEX versus OPEX. You know, how much do I spend on, on kit to, 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 to really secure my membranes and provide us a, 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 a resilient operation versus you know, what we can actually do on the run in, in OPEX. And then, and then scale inhibitors are well, very, very important. And, and increasingly we're using non-phosphorus space scale inhibitors uh, in the region because of concerns on discharge. And then we get into, as it were, the heart of total water management. And, and that always starts with understanding the current situation. You know, I've tried to highlight the importance of management and data collection. It's a really, really important beginning. And, and so we need to understand the current situation and that can take a while, it can take a few months. Um, 
And then we need to understand what monitoring, additional monitoring programs may be necessary. This is particularly the case when we're starting to reuse, say, wastewater. We need to understand the variability of that wastewater, what the limiting factors are likely to be. Then there's this kind of overlay of what are the best practices? How can we optimize the site further? How can we have a very production centric view to what we're doing here? So we're not gonna be caught out on any uh, hidden impacts uh, that I described earlier. And then it really is a case of then implementing uh, the process. So we don't implement until we have a very, very fundamental, very foundational understanding of the current situation and the variability and all the limiting factors. And then ideally we want to produce a mass balance and that could be in relation to flows or a cost mass balance something is often very interesting when you, when you actually do it you do one for co2 emissions also quite an interesting insight we could do it on water quality and we could do a mass balance on the most limited on the limiting factor like chloride or sulfate or whatever so having different mass balance perspectives on your current operation and also the likely improvements that can be achieved through total water management does give some very useful insights on honing in the optimal strategy uh, for, for a particular refinery. And then these kind of uh, the guarantees that we want to make. So, you know, water treatment isn't some sort of art. Oh, it's, it's absolutely founded in science. And with the appropriate monitoring, we can get the insights that we need. So we can understand what technical performance looks like and what the KPIs are and how they have to be met consistently to achieve that. Same for sustainable performance in terms of the guaranteeing the water savings and the energy reduction, the waste reduction, you know, tying the technologies in a very consistent, purposeful way to ensure that we can deliver on long term sustainable performance. And of course, very importantly are those financial metrics of financial performance and monetary savings um, and which need to be tied to risk management as I highlighted earlier and risk reduction so that the cost impacts and the, and the cost of mitigation are, are, are very much in balance. And we have, there's only a couple more slides left, but we have, you know, end-to-end -end water solutions that do exactly this, uh, whether it's the chemical perspective and the treatment requirements, how we actually then go on to manage those operations, whether it's a pre-treatment plant or some other aspect on site or um, the actual technologies that are required to deliver total water management. And then this very exciting area of digital uh, and some of the, uh, the, the, well, the platforms that are obviously fundamental to digital, but some of the technologies and insights, the way we manage data <clears throat> become more predictive, catch issues a lot earlier on. It allows us to have much more of a reliability centric focus to operations on refineries. And all of those together <clears throat> uh, allow us to guarantee performance with our business model and to really leverage the innovation and, and our deep understand it, and understanding. And this is the last slide, because we have the great privilege of working closely with uh, SABIC within the GCC region. Um, they're very large petrochemical complexes, as we appreciate, but, but they rely on seawater, particularly for their uh, cooling towers. So that's been an area where we've really focused in recent years. You know, seawater is associated with quite a high uh, risk of biofouling. It has an amazing impact on heat transfer. And so just by removing that biofouling, you can save millions of dollars in, in oper operational expenditure. Also has quite a reasonable scaling potential as well. So SABIC needed these innovative solutions to protect its assets from scaling and biofouling, but at the same time reduce water. And you say, well, why do you need to reduce uh, seawater? Well, because of the pumping costs, the energy footprint, some of the other aspects as well. Uh, and on the right-hand side, it, it demonstrates the magnitude of the savings when we actually have a very cohesive, integrated total water management strategy. So I'll pause there and thank you and any questions. Excellent. So what you cannot measure, you cannot manage. That's a clear message from your presentation. Uh, I also, uh, I'm reminded of an analogy, just as you cannot imagine a kitchen without water, you cannot imagine a refinery or a petrochemical plant without water. Now these plants are going to be built more and more, petrochemical, especially integrated petrochemical plant. That's the way forward for uh, hydrocarbon industry in the future because the demand uh, is not going to stop and is not going to slow down in terms of petrochemical 
uh, refining of course is going to continue for uh, quite some time. Uh, so uh, is that your calculation of 70% demand uh, extra increase by 2050 factoring all these uh, increase in uh, industry? It, it is, but as I highlighted earlier, it very much depends on the regulatory strategy around groundwater depletion. Because if it's decided that actually this groundwater in many places is truly non-renewable, it's what we often call fossil water, then we do need to stop our reliance on it. And we do need to then make up that shortfall with additional desalination, but also, and so the desalination prospects of the region, of course, are very uh, significant, but also through the reuse of water. So those um, projections do include industrial use as well as uh, other uses. I mean, the, one of the major uses, of course, in the region is for agriculture. And so we can reuse water there and often from industry where it contains a lot of nutrients. So rather than discharging that into the Red Sea or the Gulf, a lot of the nutrient rich wastewaters can be very readily repurposed into agriculture. But of course, one needs to build the framework of infrastructure to do that. So it's easier said than done sometimes, but it is certainly, there's certainly the potential opportunities there. So what are the potential risks for keep on increasing the desalination plants in the GCC? Do you see any potential risk? Well, Obviously, seawater is a, a remarkable natural resource. It's very stable in terms of its composition. But taking rewater and producing fresh water from it is actually quite a challenge. Now, and, and, it, and it, has, it can be impactful in, in, in several areas. I mean, the first in terms of operational efficiency, we actually uh, take uh, obviously water and, you know, we recover maybe 20 percent to 45 percent. And then the rest we discharge back into the sea. Sometimes that discharge back to the sea can be what we call hypersaline, contain very high concentrations of salts, which can have a, a local environmental impact. So that's something that a, a number of environmental agencies have focused on in recent years. But then it's its energy footprint. You know, it takes between three and 10 kilowatts of energy to produce one meter cubed of water through desalination. Now, there's an enormous effort going on to looking at energy efficient uh, desalination, whether it's through uh, you know, renewable energies and sunlight and PV, et cetera, and also eventually things like uh, nanocarbon tubes and, and, and such like, which are not on our immediate horizon, but nonetheless one day could be very, very impactful here. But, but the energy footprint of uh, desalination is very, very significant. And then you have these more subtle areas around you know, what we discharged, chlorine, chlorine byproducts, you know, the metals, the cleaning agents that come, you know, all of those ultimately have an impact, maybe a small impact. But yeah, so we need to really understand the, the long term impact of desalination. But at the same time, it's a vital source of fresh water in the region. And uh, to move forward, uh, definitely, then we need to introduce the circular economy in a big way, uh, very seriously. Uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Now, how would you put a, a percentage of a recycle target as a part of uh, total produced uh, wastewater? Well, that's, that's an interesting question, uh, Raj, because often there can be a regulatory driver there. You know, if they're demanding, for example, zero liquid discharge or minimal liquid discharge, then that will be the overriding factor that drives. Now, that's, I don't think it's the case in many places in the Middle East, but that could come in and that could grow. So without that kind of key regulatory driver, it's very much down to how we value water. Um, that will dictate the, the extent to which we recycle water, because obviously there's a cost attached to recycling. So the more upfront work that's done in terms of understanding the value of water in all those areas I described, particularly in terms of having a risk adjusted value to understand all the potential impacts that it has on the operation, that itself would dictate quite high rates of recycle in an operation. So a lot of our customers now are looking to, in the region of 75 to 80% of, of recycle over the longer term. Great. Uh, now to build this roadmap for the total water management, uh, what are the challenges or what are the practical obstacles uh, do you envision? Yeah, so a lot of the, the real practical issues relate around kind of fundamental data. So this is having adequate flows, for example, right across a refinery. So, 
So we often have insights to where, you know, obviously the pipe wet network and what pump outputs are and what flows in and flows out, flow out may be, but not necessarily in part of that operation where the water quality may be very good and we'd like to potentially use that waste stream before it gets mixed in uh, with the other waste streams, uh, poorer quality and such like. So having this very detailed knowledge of the flows and also the chemistry associated with those flows is really important. And once we have that insight, then we're, uh, we're able to get a grip on the variability, uh, the variability of flow, the variability of water quality. And it's that variability that's so important to nail down because it's that that drives confidence when it comes to producing the solutions, the, the big OPEX expenditure, the, the, the kits that are actually gonna um, purify that water and, and, and allow it to reuse. So we want a lot of data to get to the stage whereby we can make some confident decision-making. Great. So with that, let me start the floor for uh, questions from our participants. And we have a we are honored with the participation of our subject matter experts from various technical committees. Uh, welcome all of you, and thank you for your uh, participation. Uh, hi, Raj. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Bülent Özekten from Saudi Aramco. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, for arranging uh, such a very informative uh, session. Uh, my question will be to uh, uh, to Nalco, uh, since uh, he mentioned about the sub subic uh, uh, revamp project and uh, the study that they have done with subic for uh, and end up with the quite good saving uh, opportunities. Uh, uh, for nowadays, because we are suffering with the uh, low energy price here, especially in GCC, uh, are these when, when we uh, up to date the, the energy price here, uh, are they still uh, uh, feasible to do such a uh, project or uh, uh, reno renovation or revamp, revamp project? Uh, that that would yeah. be my, my, my question. You touched on a very important point because there's no question that the energy element is a very significant component of the total cost of water. And you can look at that in terms of cost to produce and cost to treat and cost to dispose, et cetera. You know, it does require energy and obviously to move with pumping and such like. So we want to capture the energy elements obviously in that cost of water, but there's so many other aspects to it um, in terms of the intrinsic value of water. And that's why it's so important to tie the value of water to risk and risk to operations and to have this very broad holistic view to its value. So you're right to point out that energy is a very important component of that. And of course, where you have low energy prices, that will be factored in there. But at the same time, there are so many other aspects to calculating the value of water. Uh, right, this is uh, Sanjay from Saudi Aramco. Yes, Sanjay, please. Uh, uh, thanks, Joe, for, for a very informative presentation. Uh, my you. question is, you know, not especially to the water uh, conservation side, but on the other front, you know, see, 70% of the, you know, the water, uh, the wastewater, which is impacted by, you know, the bio and uh, other pollutants. So when you use those chemicals, for instance, the chlor chlorine, what NALCO is doing, you know, as, as to improve the better performance of those, those materials? Are we going to come with some kind of, you know, substitute or, or, or the other better material? which have a lesser environmental impacts uh, and also the better efficiency. Yeah, so just to be clear, and thank you for your comments, Sanjay, is, is that in relation to chlorine um, itself in particular and the consequences of using chlorine? Yeah, so basically yeah. basically, my question is very straightforward. Uh, what Aramco is doing to improve the chemical performance, you know, rather than, you know, of course we are looking to reduce and reuse, recycle this water to improve the, you know, water scarcity like that. But on the other front, other point to make the TCO, as you mentioned, you know, total cost of operation, it can also be minimized if you have a better and, and, the, and the most effective and the better performing chemicals. Absolutely. So, I mean, chemical performance is actually quite a complex topic because you rightly say there's, there's a cost element there, of course, but at the end of the day, it's the efficacy and the, the result from the treatment, you want to have a return on investment of many, many fold to one. So, and, and that's what we tend to see. But you mentioned chlorine, and that's interesting because. There is a concern over the use of chlorine and the byproducts and the long-term implications of those byproducts. We have alternatives like, for example, pure chlorine dioxide, which 
Uh, chlorine dioxide is very, very different from chlorine. It doesn't produce nowhere near as much byproduct material and yet very, very effective. And that comes brings me on to this point of efficacy, because if we don't get good microbiological control of our systems, almost every other aspect is doomed to failure. They really do take over. They coat pipes, they have under deposit corrosion mechanisms, they really interfere with heat transfer. You know, biofilm is normally four or five times uh, more impactful than scale in terms of heat transfer. You know, it's holding a lot of water very tightly to the heat transfer surfaces, etc. So on one hand, we really want these products to perform and make significant savings as they do. But we also, to your point, have to monitor the byproducts and we certainly don't want to be cost effective in those applications. So we do need to consider a lot of elements when we when we consider these, uh, these key issues, for sure. Uh, no, Jeff, thank you. Another question, yeah. you know, uh, because, you know, of course, we need to go towards the circularity, you know, rather than the linear approach. So I see that there are several other elements like technology, digital applications, and, uh, and other than the best practices and uh, other effective, you know, measures. So it's NALCO. Do you engage with the facility to develop a kind of holistic uh, long-term roadmap, which can help us, you know, including our regulations and other uh, inclusions, help us you know, achieve some kind of, you know, future targets, uh, like... Uh, having a zero discharge kind of thing. So is your team engaged? Are you providing those kind of services? Absolutely, yeah. It's a really important area for us because we, we want to understand what our customers' ambitions are. And in fact, it's an interesting time for us because a lot of those ambitions are really centered around what is now nine years time, 2030, where many large corporations are conveying their CO2 emission reduction, for example, and it's between now and 2030, or trying to achieve neutrality by 2050. A number of companies have a water reduction ambition between now and 2030. So uh, we can take that ambition as a starting point and really understand how it can be achieved without it being impactful on the day to operation, but also mindful that during over the next nine years to 2030, our customers want to grow and they want to grow significantly. So recognizing that they will by default produce more CO2 emissions and need more water as they grow organically. So we do need to have a very comprehensive view on a roadmap. How do we get to where we need to be, say, over a period of five years or a little bit longer? And there's a lot of things to consider there, uh, Sanjay, not least the investment strategy. You know, do we invest up front or do we actually allow certain technologies to mature, become more cost effective and therefore perhaps delay that investment to another three years or so when that's like more likely to be the case? So when you start having these very detailed ambitions, it allows us to produce this roadmap of which the investment strategy is really critical. Obviously the investment plan in terms of technology is vital as well, but the whole journey starts with this really comprehensive understanding of now, of the current operation and what can be done and how to get from here today to there tomorrow and how to do that in, a, in the risk, lowest risk way possible uh, and the lowest cost impact possible. So. Absolutely. What you described there, Sanjay, is very much day-to-day -day life for us. Dr. Joff, thank you again for giving us the uh, opportunity to listen to your uh, enlightening talk and presentation. I think uh, a lot of us will take away valuable message from your presentation. And definitely water is something very important for our life, for our industry to go forward. And uh, as you rightly said, that uh, we, if we do not measure, we cannot uh, manage. So measuring, uh, uh, monitoring, and also then thinking of a roadmap, which will include everything from environment, from energy, from operational efficiency, from our wastage, which, we, which is built into our behavior. Uh, I was uh, shocked to see that uh, uh, we, uh, we utilize three times more than the uh, world average uh, in the GCC. Uh, that's something very alarming and we need to probably uh, think about it. So thank you very much for enlightening us with all this uh, information and messages. Uh, would you like to leave any last thought? Just to thank you and uh, Raj for your kind comments and to thank the, uh, the GDA team for all your support. Indeed, water is one of the life's critical uh, issues and, and uh, you know, we take it very, very seriously, but we have a plan and 
we love engaging with our customers to better understand their operations and how we can address circularity over the coming years. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Joff. And once again, thank you, you and the Ecolab team uh, to put in this uh, effort together. Thank you. So that brings to the close of our uh, session. Uh, uh, you will be able to download a copy of this presentation uh, after this presentation on the description of this video, uh, there will be a link and you can click on that and you can download this presentation. And uh, many of those who are not aware of this series of GDA conversations, we started this series way back in May 2020 when the pandemic hit us and we became paralyzed. We could not move. We could not physically meet. But we said, why not? We do the virtual meetings. We do the virtual conversations. And that's how we started this series. And we have done over 12, uh, in fact, 14. This is the 15th episode. And uh, all of those are available on our website, uh, gda.org.ph. Please go to our website and watch. Uh, they are very interesting, very thought-provoking and insightful. Uh, we hope you will enjoy all of that. And uh, with that, I wish you a very, very safe, healthy and prosperous future. God bless. Thank you.